Eminent writer and philosopher, Professor Sir Roger Scruton, has for over three decades taught at institutions on both sides of the Atlantic, including Birkbeck College, Boston University, and more recently, the University of Buckingham. He is an author of over 40 books. In his work as a philosopher, he has specialized in aesthetics, with particular attention to music and architecture. He has written several works of fiction, as well as memoirs and essays on topics of general interest. He engages in contemporary political and cultural debates from the standpoint of a conservative thinker and is well known as a powerful polemicist. He is a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and the British Academy. He has been officially honored by the Czech Republic, by the city of Plesin, I hope that's close, and by Virginia's General Assembly. In 2004, he received the Ingersoll Weaver Prize for scholarly letters. In 2015, he published three books, all of which were chosen among the People's Books of, of uh, the Year. In 2016, he was recipient of the Polish Lech Kaczynski Foundation's Medal of Courage and Integrity, was awarded the Italian Masi Prize for uh, the culture of wine in recognition of his book, I Drink, Therefore I Am. and was knighted in that year uh, in the Queen's, Queen's Birthday Honor List. Uh, we're glad to have with us Professor Roger Scruton. Okay. Well, uh, as, you can, as you heard, that was on the verge of becoming a list of my sins. Um, but, um, uh, I, I realize that in this place, uh, I've got to be on my very best behavior. So I shall begin by thanking the Wheatley Institution and Richard Williams especially for inviting me and uh, for, have, for thinking about this important question. Let me see if I can make this work. Uh, the question of what these three great concepts really embrace and what they have to do with each other. Uh, Richard Williams got in touch with me saying, look, you're an expert on aesthetics, and we here in the Church of Latter-day Saints, uh, we believe in the, in the beautiful, the good and the true, but we don't know how to say what we believe. And you have been working all your life on this, so you should come and tell us. Uh, and I, all I can say at this point is that be perhaps because I've been working all my life on this, I don't know how to say anything about it. All, it always I come back to questions. Uh, and the only benefit of having thought about these questions for so long is that there is a certain clarity in asking them, but no further clarity in answering them. Now, that shouldn't d depress you, because in a true philosophical approach to things, it is the clarity of the question in the end that really matters because that enables you to fit the subject matter into your own life and make the decisions that you have to make about it. Now, um, so let me say a few things about art and truth, first of all. The enlightenment, which, uh, uh, by which I mean that, uh, that um, ma mass of thinking and, uh, and idea-mongering that began in the beginning of the 17th century and went on through to, to the beginning of the 19th. That, that period in our intellectual history uh, uh, brought with it, as you, I, I'm sure you know, a certain loss of the religious anchor in everyday life. Maybe in this part of the world, that loss was not felt so much. Um, of course, there was nobody living in this part of the world just then. Uh, but there was your ancestors uh, lost somewhere on the way to this place uh, who um, did probably ha feel that a residue of this great uh, movement of ideas that began in Europe uh, and um, recognized that the scientific worldview, which had come to the fore with, with Newton, was posing a certain threat to the more naive of one's religious beliefs. And uh, among educated people, especially in, in France and, uh, and uh, Britain, uh, the, uh, and in Germany too, there was uh, an attempt to find a rival source of meaning 
to, to the religious, to find that rival source of meaning in art. Uh, because for, for various reasons, art uh, struck people as having a, a different status from science. Science was a threat to religion. That's true because it was uh, undermining the old explanation of things in which God took such an important place. Um, but art uh, seemed to represent a different way of looking at the world from science, one which, as it were, preserved the mystery of things and didn't un uh, undo the mystery. And since it, the, the mystery was so important, why not look to art uh, uh, as a source of meaning? So art suddenly became prominent uh, as a, a human enterprise, and with it, the birth of the subject of aesthetics. Aesthetics being the philosophy of art uh, and the philosophy of beauty. And uh, now that I, there's three important figures I mentioned there, Shaftesbury, Baumgarten, and Kant. Shaftesbury was an um, English philosopher, third Earl of Shaftesbury, who was um, a pupil of John Locke, who uh, wrote very influential essays about the, the role of the beautiful in the formation of the human spirit. He was a, an educationist uh, and um, somebody who felt that it was his duty to, uh, uh, to draw the attention of his contemporaries to the complexity uh, of human life and to the consolations that we find in human life. And beauty is one of them. He was very influential, but the, though his theories are somewhat uh, uh, all over the place. Baumgarten was the person who invented the word aesthetics as a, the name for a discipline. He wrote a book called Aesthetica, um, which was about the art of poetry. Aesthetica, the, um, aesthesis is the original word, it's the uh, Greek word, uh, uh, as I'm sure many of you know, for, for feeling. Uh, we, we have it in our word anesthetic. Um, and the, the burden of his book, uh, aesthetica was that poetry communicates uh, truths about our condition, but tr uh, communicates them not through abstract thought, but through concrete feeling. Uh, and that therefore uh, it's a different kind of truth and it has a different role in our lives and a different value for us. So we, uh, he began the whole enterprise of distinguishing the artistic way of looking at the world from the literal-minded and, and possibly scientific way. And Kant, who was uh, much influenced by Baumgarten, took this up and wrote the first systematic work of aesthetics. So, so these um, uh, great thinkers raised the question, what do we learn from art? Uh, and uh, is what we learn from art a kind of truth, a truth that we perhaps couldn't learn from any other uh, uh, human activity? Well, uh, uh, for a start, art is not one kind of thing. There is abstract art and representational art. Abstract art is like music or like abstract painting, uh, abstract sculpture. Uh, it doesn't actually have a subject matter. That's the whole point of it. You're, you're supposed to appreciate it for what it is in itself for the harmony of lines and figures, for the way, ways in which things balance against each other. Uh, it's supposed to attract attention purely for its own sake and not for the um, subject matter that it represents. Right, so already that makes it rather difficult to say exactly what it is that we, uh, that we learn from art. Uh, and then, of course, what about fictions? The, the realm of art includes things like novels, plays, films, uh, uh, poetry, all of which are about the world in some way, but they don't give you literal truths about the world. They are about fictional worlds, uh, and it requires an effort of the imagination both to create a fiction and also to appreciate it. When you read a, a, a great novel like, uh, say, uh, Jane Austen's Emma, it's not in order to find out about some person called Emma Woodhouse. You know there is no such person. But you do know, nevertheless, that in the creation of this fiction, uh, Jane Austen has put some part of herself and some part of her uh, deep observations of the human condition. But they aren't literal truths about a particular person's lives, a life. So what kind of truth are they? Or is there another kind of truth? So that's one of the problems that, that um, 
uh, we encounter in this area. Then there is the problem of the role of experience. If you read a poem uh, to, to yourself or recite a poem, uh, you know that what matters is the sound of that poem, the structure of it, of it the, the way the verse unfolds, the form of it, but not what it literally says, or at least not what it literally says when, ex when extracted from that form. This is not like a textbook. If you, if you were curious about a nuclear physics, you might pick up a textbook of nuclear physics, read it, and having absorbed it, and being diligent students, memorize the whole lot, you put it on the shelf, and that's it. That's the last time you look at it, because you've extracted the information from it. Uh, but that's not the way that people appreciate poems, is it? It's, it's not that they extract the information and then uh, never visit it again. On the contrary, a, a good poem is one that gains from repetition, uh, even when you know it by heart, uh, and even when it says something that seems extremely light, uh, 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 even if it touches with a light touch the, the, the realities of this world. Like, uh, say, Robert Frost's Stopping by Woods, you know, uh, it doesn't say very, very much, but the, the form, the rhythm, uh, uh, and the way in which it seems to touch something deep in you uh, mean that you will want to repeat it, want to go on reading it again and again. So one thought, th th then, is that we don't actually go to art for information. Uh, the information content is not the primary thing. It's the experience. Um, uh, 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 but of course... Anyway, not all truth is information. We have lots of different ideas of truth. Uh, Christ said famously, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Well, he didn't mean truth in the sense that scientists use that word, that, he, that he, he is somehow a true representation of the world. He meant something deeper. He meant that you can trust in me. Uh, and that by trusting in me, you come to know something about yourself, how far you can go uh, in, in whatever direction uh, and with what kind of hope. So that use of the idea of truth, which brings in a notion of trust, perhaps is, um, is a more important one for considering art, because we find support in the person we trust. And it's like that with art as well. You know, in many works of art, uh, we feel that we're in the presence of a genuine spirit. Many people feel this, of course, about the work, works by, uh, of Beethoven, who described his, his Missa Solemnis in, uh, in the preface as from the heart to the heart. What he meant was that, uh, that this was an utter sincere outpouring of what he felt, and he expected the audience uh, to engage with it in the same spirit, uh, as though he, uh, trusting in him to, to be the guardian of their emotions for the, for the hour-long experience that he was offering. So there's a, that kind of idea of truth is a very different one from the scientific one, but it still seems to be an idea of truth. Now, um, this brings up the topic of, uh, of desire and pleasure, huge topic. Uh, now, I have to say that uh, I'm talking here as a professional philosopher. I know many people in this audience are studying other subjects, are simply uh, curious about the intellectual world, and don't, um, are, are not used to thinking in this abstract philosophical way. So uh, I apologize but just hope that I will inspire you to, to um, go on and pursue the matter further. So there is a connection between desiring something and feeling pleasure on obtaining it. If you really want a, a glass of water, then of course uh, on obtaining that glass and drinking you feel pleasure, the pleasure of satisfying a desire. But it's not a simple connection because we know that many things that we desire uh, don't give us pleasure when we obtain them. And this is one of the most important parts of moral education, to recognize the difference between those things that you desire, which will bring satisfaction when you obtain them, and those things which you desire, which when you taste them, you push them away with revulsion. Now, uh, um, I won't go into that, but of course, you might think that maybe art has something to do with that too. Maybe it can teach us in advance about the things which we 
uh, won't enjoy when, we've, when we possess them. Well, there are many kinds of pleasure. There's pure sensual pleasure, like you, know, um, you, get, you sink into a hot bath at the end of the day. Uh, and this is a pleasure of the, uh, uh, of the senses as the warmth spreads through your body. Uh, it, d it doesn't tell you anything about the world. It's not, it's not um, based on any kind of thinking. Um, uh, uh, but it's a s the kind of pleasure that animals have. But we also have intellectual pleasures, um, pleasures which come from thinking things. The pleasure of reading a book um, is not a, a sensory pleasure at all, is it? It's a pleasure of the mind, the pleasure of following an argument, of, of playing with words, and so on. And then there's what I call intentional pleasures. Um, in, the word intentional means directed, directed outwards onto the world. Like the pleasure you take in somebody's giving you a present. Uh, the pleasure you take when you go to see your child take part in, the, in, in say, in the 100-meter race or in the long jump or whatever, and you see in the playing field, there he is, he's done it. He's got, he's got the... Uh, uh, he's, He's got the first prize. That's a pleasure about something. Uh, and when, uh, when you have a pleasure about something, that means you can make a mistake as well. It was, the, the race was at the other end of the field, and it looked exactly as though your son had won it. Only later do you discover it was someone else, a look-alike. So, so was your pleasure real or not? In a sense, it was real, but it was also a mistake. So there's there mistaken pleasures, and that's a very interesting fact. Um, so that pleasures can be at, the, um, I could take pleasure at, at the, the, the beautiful scene out of the window. I can take pleasure about uh, the, uh, the triumph of my son in the long jump and so on. Now, aesthetic pleasure is uh, um, of the first kind. It's, it's pleasure at something. It's not, not like pleasures of taste. When you, when you um, eat a strawberry ice cream and take pleasure in it, um, yeah, that's a pleasant taste in the mouth. Um, when you look at a profound picture and are moved by it, that's not a, a, a pleasant feeling anywhere in you, is it? It's not a, sens it's not a sensation of pleasure. You're pleased at this, uh, this uh, thing that you're looking at uh, and pleased by it, maybe pleased about what it's saying and so on, but it's, a, it's completely different from a sensory pleasure. And that's a great question, therefore, of what is the relation between tastes in food and drink and tastes in music and painting? They're not the same kind of thing at all. Uh, you like strawberries and I like uh, blueberries. Fine. There's no real um, disagreement between us, just different tastes. But you like Beethoven and, uh, and I like heavy metal. This is a bit more like a disagreement, uh, especially if you then go on to say, you know, that your liking heavy metal is a sign of the degeneracy of your soul. Uh, <laughs> uh, and the, the argument can begin then. It may not be uh, um, uh, possible to resolve it, but the fact is, when it, in matters of um, artistic and aesthetic judge, judgment, um, we do argue and the arguments are very important to us. It, it maybe you, you don't think this about because you're not interested in, in Beethoven and heavy metal, but there are always going to be uh, areas where you are interested. Suppose you've, you ha live in a little town which has the beautiful houses and beautiful streets and you're really pleased with it. Your neighborhood is charming and, and somehow consoling because of the, its orderliness, and someone builds a huge uh, skyscraper in the middle, or puts in a planning application for a big skyscraper in, in uh, uh, bright orange uh, uh, tiles. You know, uh, you will then start getting together with your neighbours to campaign against this. Uh, you will be um, there. There will be an, uh, an ar arguments we put forward as to who is right and who is wrong. So, uh, and these matter enormously. These arguments to people. Looking at the architectural mess between uh, Salt Lake City and Provo, uh, I, I suspect that m Americans don't think about this as much as they should. <laughs> but, 
Uh, on the other hand, if you, uh, uh, anybody who's been to Europe will recognize that there people do think about these things and argue about them all the time. Uh, and uh, as a result, the tourist, uh, all sensible tourists, don't spend their holidays here, but in Europe. <laughs> anyway, that's a, um, another matter. But, so the great question then is, what is the value of this kind of pleasure, the pleasure that we feel in works of art and aesthetic objects? Can it be a vehicle of truth? Well, it's very interesting that we, we can feel pleasure in works of art, even when the, the, the works of art are sad or even tragic. We take pleasure in a sad story uh, because the story, it does something to the sadness. Right, you know, the, 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 the weepy movie uh, may have enormous appeal. You may feel it hasn't worked if you hadn't uh, had a bit of a weep during the course of it. You know, uh, the, uh, the sadness is part of what, what was promised. It's part of the deal. Um, and yet it can't be real sadness because nobody uh, voluntarily submits himself to that. But it's something like sadness uh, put in a frame. And the story puts it in a frame and makes it uh, such that it doesn't hurt you in the way that, for, inst the, for instance, the death of someone you love would hurt you. Um, and that's, that framing of our emotions seems to be one of the things that, that works of art do for us, isn't it? That, uh, that we, um, we, we seem to be able to come to terms with the sadness of human life, partly because we can represent it in ways that make it more meaningful, uh, uh, framed uh, 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 and isolated. So to pleasure, we always say, come again. Uh, but to knowledge, we say, thanks. You know, once you've obtained the knowledge, that's it, you've got it. But uh, the pleasure, okay, you've had it once, but you want it again. And especially in the case of works of art, uh, the repeatability of the pleasure is what it's all about. But perhaps sometimes there is repetition, uh, there is knowledge in repetition. So let's uh, uh, s just think about that for a moment. Uh, I want to say something about first, though, about art and virtue. And moving on now from truth to goodness. Uh, what, what is the moral value of art? What kind of um, moral improvement can art uh, generate in us? Can, has it got a particular role in presenting the moral world and in pr improving our own engagement in it? Um, well, obviously, art is a source of moral examples, but the work of art does not merely present the example. You know, if, uh, there's lots of examples which are just you can sketch for yourself as to how of good behavior and bad behavior. It puts us in a position of judgment. Uh, I mentioned there Henry James's portrait of Isabel Archer, which I'm hoping that that uh, you young people will be about to read if you haven't read it yet in Portrait of a Lady, um, in which um, Henry James uh, presents to us a, a, a good woman who is also naive and exploited by a cunning and, uh, and, uh, and evil man. And um, he doesn't uh, judge himself but he puts us in a position to make a judgment and to make the judgment through her eyes. The, the reader gradually comes to understand her situation as she comes to understand it. Now that's, what, that's real art. He never says anything, the, 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 the writer, Henry James. Um, he makes you think it, but think it for yourself. Uh, and that, that might have a special moral value, mightn't it? Rather than just telling you what, to th what, the, uh, what to think morally, making you think it for yourself. So as it were, you're, you're, uh, it's a, a course of education in the emotions that, that is directed at you. Well, that all looks quite plausible for fiction and for, for representational art. But what about abstract art? People think... Uh, um, that you know, that abstract art, art which doesn't have a, a representational content, can also have some kind of moral value. That's what Beethoven was saying about his Missa Solemnis, what many people say about, uh, 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 about music generally, that, that it is telling us something about our emotions by leading us to feel 
uh, uh, second hand, so to speak, what those emotions are. There's a kind of emotional education going on there too. But then th there are real problems, and this is one that Richard Williams wanted me to talk about, and, um, and it's a very difficult one to talk about. Uh, wh what happens when there is, when you encounter a work of art that presents vice, re really uh, um, vicious behavior, but aesthetically, in such a way as to make the vice attractive. And I take the example here of Salome. The, here is the, the problem, as you remember, of Salome, uh, uh, the, the story uh, of the daughter of Herodias who, who um, danced before the, uh, the king, or well, did she or did she, didn't she? Uh, but anyway, she coveted the head of John the Baptist, perhaps because her mother had put her up to it, and it, uh, finally persuaded the king to give it to her, in other words, to, to kill uh, the prophet whom he had been um, reluctant to do up to that moment because of his, his manifest holiness. Well, uh, this, this was made into a play by Oscar Wilde, a rather clever play, um, and um, then that was set to music by Richard Strauss. And his music is full of a kind of distraught lasciviousness but it's, it's very beautiful and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, seductive. I, I won't play it to you, but I'll leave it to you uh, to, um, to encounter it. It's all, all over YouTube, uh, of course. Um, and this music kind of brings you to Salome's side. You feel that somehow she's in the grip of an emotion that she can't deal with. She's got to satisfy it. And uh, she, but as represented by Strauss and, and Oscar Wilde, Salome goes uh, the whole hog and takes hold of the head and kisses it. And here's the kind of thing that you see in modern opera productions. Modern opera productions are designed specially to be offensive to um, members of the Church of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, uh, so don't worry, they're, they're usually much worse than this. But here is Salome having sung her, her incredible aria of sensual ecstasy uh, over the, uh, over the uh, severed head of John the Baptist, seizing it uh, and kissing it in this uh, unacceptable way. Well, most people would feel that's going too far. In fact, people did sit, think, feel that it was going too far, and this opera did have quite a bit of trouble uh, in its early life, but now it's part of the repertoire. Um, uh, and, uh, and yet it seems to, uh, to take a kind of ghoulish pleasure in utterly perverted behavior uh, and to the music seems to put that behavior in a, in a, in a kind of enchanting light, you know, because the music is drawing you in all the time. You find similar things in other works of art of the, late, uh, the mid to late 19th century, uh, art that rescues evil by making it seem beautiful. Uh, Baudelaire's Fleur du Mal, which I'm sure some of you who are doing French here will, have, will, will be reading and studying, uh, is a very good example of this. It's, um, he takes the excesses and the degeneracies of life in the modern city and looks for a meaning that lies concealed within them. Uh, and he does this by, um, through incredibly powerful imagery and beautiful verse forms that make it look as though um, there is a spiritual meaning behind all this that, re that redeems it. You know, the spiritual is revealed even though the, what is described it denies the possibility of the spiritual. It's as though by denying things in the right way, we can affirm them. And I think that's what um, Baudelaire himself thought. That, uh, I mean, often people have described him as a Christian poet precisely for this, that he finds, he rescues from the heart of uh, corruption and despair that little uh, germ uh, uh, of spiritual purity which l lies in the imagery of his verse and which we take away and then can, as it were, make to grow within us. Not sure whether that is true, but it's an interesting thought. Uh, in Shakespeare, of course, there's a lot of evil, the evil of the character of Iago in Othello uh, and also Macbeth, who is a self-doubting evil, evil man. Uh, but it's straightforward, uh, you know, Shakespeare doesn't expect you to be on their side in any way. He certainly doesn't do a Salome on them. Although, at a certain point, there is a lot of sympathy for Macbeth. And Milton's Satan, 
in Paradise Lost is another very important example uh, of uh, an evil character who is so portrayed by the verse, the verse is so powerful that uh, you cannot fail to be on his side. His wounded pride uh, is something you immediately identify with and um, you come to see that, that, that there's a kind of nobility about it. Uh, and, the ver and this is what the verse is doing. Is this, is this a, a immoral verse, therefore? It's bringing you to the side of Satan. Um, Blake, in his uh, illustrations seems to, uh, for the Paradise Lost, seems to think that. Right, uh, so there's some other examples I give you there. Um, uh, Claggart, the bosun in Herman Melville's Tale of Billy Budd, another one that you're probably about to be to read, set, made into a brilliant opera by Benjamin Britten. And then there's Dmitri in The Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. What do we think about him? Is he just confused? Uh, or, or, or are we being, again, brought in to the uh, 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 world of a character who is unable to make moral judgments for himself? And uh, aren't we also perhaps uh, confused as to whether we can make those judgments? So one of the questions that arise here is wh what is the distinction between moral art and moralizing art? Here is a uh, piece of uh, Russian uh, uh, revolutionary art from the 1917 revolution, which is uh, manifestly moralizing. It's telling you that these, these pe people are obviously mistreated. Uh, so what? You know, um, it, it, is it saying anything that helps you to understand that mistreatment or to take a different stance towards it? Or is it just uh, like a moral tale, a, uh, uh, just an illustration to something else? So many people feel that art shouldn't moralize as directly as this. It's too crude. Uh, it should be more like Henry James uh, in um, Portrait of a Lady, uh, making you do the moralizing rather than doing the moralizing itself. Well, um, that may be so, but uh, let's go on. Uh, I, I want to say a little bit about beauty now. Um, so I've, I've said some things about art's relation to truth something about its relation to goodness. Both, in both, both cases, extremely complicated. It seems that there's nothing simple that you can say. And what about beauty? Um, there's a certain kind of habit uh, that arose, especially in the late 19th century, uh, connected with people like Oscar Wilde, uh, which, of putting aesthetic values f first, saying that, that, that these are the things that matter. Um, uh, and um, uh, Wilde famously said, in matters of the greatest importance, it is style and not sincerity that counts. Um, and he lived his life, or at least pretended to live his life, as though that were his guiding principle, to be elegant uh, and um, uh, soothing to, to, to the eye, but, um, and to ignore all those... Uh, uh, those simple old-fashioned moral values which got in the way of that. But he didn't, also, in his works of art, he didn't think that. But um, to put aesthetic values first is or might be a kind of immoralism. Osmond, who is the husband of Isabel Archer uh, in The Portrait of a Lady, is somebody who really does put aesthetic values first. And his delight in collecting beautiful things and, and living this aesthetic way of life has led him to a great, uh, uh, into great pecuniary need. He needs, he needs money, and she has money. So he marries her in order to get hold of that money, and also in order to collect her, because she was beautiful too. So he collects her as a beautiful object, but doesn't love her. Um, Oscar Wilde is a, a slightly cruder version of the same idea in the character of Lord Henry Wotton in the picture of Dorian Gray. But there are two sides to the aesthetic experience. There's the kind of relishing side and the exploring side. Um, you know, uh, relishing a, a beautiful work of art, a, a sublime work of music, that's something that you can do without necessarily exploring the depths of the human heart, even though the, the work of art touches on them. 
Uh, and perhaps this, this kind of aestheticism means forgetting the cognitive dimension of aesthetic pleasures, that they're not just pl uh, sensory pleasures, they're not just pleasures in the way you, know, you experience things, they're also directed towards a vision of the world. So each of those goals that I've talked about, truth and goodness and beauty, um, they are important because they are what you're focusing on, but they seem to reduce art itself to an inadequate means. You know, they, they seem to leave out the aesthetic dimension. So only when combined in a unity, uh, the kind of truth and the kind of goodness of which beauty is the sign, do these values mark out a path for art. That then, you know, if, if beauty is its, it, the way in which truth is presented, the way in which goodness comes to your consciousness, then we would seem to have a, a, something like an account of the value of art. Well, um, th there is a question here about meaning and form. The, the meaning of a work of art, and this goes back to Baumgarten, it lies in the form and is not really detachable from it. Uh, if you try to translate a poem into, stra into straight uh, prose, say what it means, give its equivalent in, in simple language, then you lose the meaning. So the meaning is not just what it says. It's the, it, it resides also in the form and is not detachable from that. Um, now, this is a little, a little bit like religion and revealed truth. Uh, it, it, there's a... In much religion, there's a promise of another way of seeing the world, what you might call a God's eye perspective, that, um, that it's not just that, that there are theological doctrines, you know, God exists, Christ is the Son of God, etc. cetera, um, although those are important to the Christian religion. Uh, there is also revealed truth. When you meditate on these things and suddenly you see the world in another way as though from God's perspective. Uh, and perhaps that, uh, in those circumstances, the form of, uh, of the, the language that, that you're studying the, the, uh, in a sacred text, for instance, is very important, just as it is in poetry. That's why those great texts have been preserved because they, not just for what they say, but for their way of saying it. And again, in religion too, as in art, repetition is very important. You repeat so the service every, every week. Uh, a prayer, you, you know, like the Lord's Prayer, you say it every day. It's not, if somebody said to you, what a waste of time, you know, you said it once, uh, why say it again? You know what it means, you know the words, what, what's, what's all this about? You know that that's not what, a, what prayer is for. Prayer is about putting you back into the relation with God that, uh, that you're constantly slipping out of. And that, therefore it demands repetition. Um, and there are truths that have to be rehearsed if they are to be owned. Uh, when to, to know exactly how to feel something, what, what to feel towards uh, the world around you. Uh, you might feel you know it one moment, but you've lost it the next. Uh, and getting the right words helps you to recapture it. So that idea of revealed truth that comes to you through repetition, as in prayer, is a bit like uh, the aesthetic experience as I've been describing it. Perhaps it gives you a, a secular version of revealed truth. That's what um, people like Nietzsche and Wagner thought. Um, and they, they went further and thought that uh, actually uh, art could therefore be a substitute for religion. That's what we really should be um, now devoting ourselves to. We have art, uh, as uh, Nietzsche says, so, so, so as um, not, to, uh, you know, not to die of despair. The, the, our art is still there giving us this meaning, even when we've lost faith. Now, I won't talk about this, that, but... Um, all right, just to f finally, some thoughts about the intrinsic values of art. Poetry and plays and paintings, they present imaginary worlds. So um, representational art uh, gives us uh, a, 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 an opening onto the, wor the world of the imagination. And they all rescue their subject matter uh, from a purely instrumental conception of its significance. 
Things portrayed in art are not portrayed as useful. They're portrayed as interesting for their own sake. So they're rescued from their instrumentality. And that's why every illusion matters. The image is a, a distillation of the thing depicted. Um, and poetry and painting work in the same way. Um, and here is a, a landscape by Van Gogh, which uh, 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 everybody knows, probably. Um, that uh, the brush strokes there imbue the landscape with an observing consciousness. They are marks of the moral being for whom this is not a thing, but a vision. Um, uh, and um, you know, to, to absorb that, is to, you will recognize that it's a very long way from the way a, a field of wheat with a, 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 a flock of, uh, uh, of uh, rooks above it would look. But nevertheless, um, uh, it says restart required. Uh, I mean, it's referring to me. Um, <laughs> so, right, I'm restarting. Uh, it doesn't look in, in any way realistic, but somehow it has a power that you wouldn't have if it was wholly realistic, because the brush strokes of the painter imbue that landscape with his own soul. Uh, and it's as though the imagination of the, of the painter had re reworked the thing that he's painting so that it isn't just the thing, it's also uh, that thing distilled into his own consciousness. Uh, and um, so in the imagination, we are thinking about absent and non-existent things, but uh, the consciousness uh, involved is a creator of its own object. As, uh, uh, in, as in that case of Van Gogh. Uh, the, the imagination is something that we can will. I can ask you to imagine some things. I should say, imagine a field of wheat. You won't be able to imagine it like Van Gogh did, but nevertheless, you will summon it up in, uh, uh, in obedience to that order. And that, uh, that is an interesting thing. Uh, and through the works of the imagination, we bring distant things into close relation with each other. That's what we do in figures of speech in poetry. We're bringing things into relation with each other. And with the brush strokes in the painting, we're b bringing a human action in relation to a landscape. Uh, and the ima these imaginary worlds that we create can strike us as true or as false. And I want to give, 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 contrast that Van Gogh with a painting by Thomas Kincaid. Um, this is one of his uh, uh, visions of paradise. Um, this is a controversial painter, as uh, you know. Van Gogh died in poverty. Uh, Kincaid died leaving $53 million um, uh, and died of drink. Um, uh, uh, and was, uh, uh, he, uh, I think, one in 10 American households have a Kincaid uh, above them mantelpiece because it's a soothing um, thing that is, is for some people this is a vision of what painting should be it's it's much truer to the appearance of things than Van Gogh but there's a question about it what is that question many people say that there's a falsification behind this kind of painting um, I don't want to cast judgment on, on, on it but um, uh, just to say a few things about it what, why does this strike so many people as false in one sense, it's truer than the Van Gogh. It's closer to the way things actually look. But the falsification, if it exists, is a falsification of the observer rather than of the observed. It shows a world presented through a veil of self-congratulatory sentiment. That's at least what the critic would say. It tells you that you are a good person and no further efforts need be made. Van Gogh is not telling you that at all. He's telling you that that life is rough and you need to make efforts uh, even to see this. So it tells you that yeah, that no further efforts need be made and that meaning lies in the forms and the colors, those pastel shades smeared over the landscape like a disease. So, well, is that right? Leave it to you to think. Um, but whatever, um, this brings us back to the parallel between art and religion. Um, religion pr provides us with truth, but it's not just straightforward literal truth about the way the world is. There are stories, all sorts of things that we believe, but there's a much more important dimension to it, uh, a truth, a, a spiritual truth, uh, and um, which tells us how things really are. 
really are for us and, and what our position really is in the world of human relations and human emotions. And in religion, we recognize that there's no redemption through falsehood. And the same seems to be true of art. That's what those two pictures, I think, uh, at least lead us to suppose. That it, uh, art, too, has its own way of presenting the tr spiritual truth of things. And if it falsifies, then it doesn't produce the kind of redemptive consolation that we're looking for. Uh, and this might explain, going back to sadness in works of art, it might explain the power of tragedy. In tragedy, you, you go to the depths, but you find a, a kind of rescue there. Um, so uh, uh, only if you go to those depths, however, will you be rescued, enjoying sadness for its own sake and just a, a sentimental pretense at, at, at grief is not going to help but actually going to the full encounter with human mortality and what it means, as in a, a real tragedy, maybe that is a help. Maybe that does take us to a point where we can actually learn something that we need to learn, learn it in our hearts and in our emotions, and you know, learn to, to bear this thing. Perhaps that is why we want to go to tragedies again and again. So uh, art is, is certainly not gonna be any help to us if it loses sight of what we are and what we need. Uh, and um, we do recognize that there is a distinction between true and false uh, emotion. What uh, false emotion comes about when I, the I, eclipses the you. Most, most love, most real love, is about you, the other. Um, but sentimental love pretends to be about you, but it's really about me me feeling this wonderful thing and showing thereby my moral distinction. You know, it's, it's, and we see, find that kind of sentimentality in art, and also we find art which challenges that sentimentality. Um, Thomas Kincaid is all about me being a lovely person. Whereas Van Gogh is all about you, the you that appears to him through, even in a field of wheat, because of course that's God who's appearing, appear, appearing to him. Uh, so, as I'm going back to what I said about Henry James, real art doesn't judge, it opens the world to judgment. And, um, how, let me go back. Uh, um, and inspires that judgment in us. And there, I wanted to finish with some difficult examples. Um, in the Brothers Karamazov, another one book that you might be on the verge of, of, of reading, or, or on the verge of, uh, of um, not bothering to read, um, Dostoevsky doesn't judge. He invites us to judge in his stead. But what he's inviting us to judge is a whole community of people who don't judge, um, uh, but just, uh, uh, just do in the most horrifying way. And this is a very challenging book, therefore. Dickens, in uh, Old Curiosity Shop, the death of Little Nell, Little Nell uh, lays it on with a trowel, uh, trying to make us weep over the death of this innocent little girl who's forgiving everybody for, her, for, for, for dying before her time. And it's not only unrealistic and implausible, but, but uh, re real schmaltz. And Oscar Wilde famously said about this, uh, that a man must have a heart of stone not to laugh at the death of Little Nell. Um, <laughs> which is a brilliant way of summarizing it. Um, in the Salome case, though, this is a realization in imagined form of a grim state of mind, a really horrible state of mind, but realized without any negative judgment. That's the, the great problem. That this is music of sublime power, which simply has to, uh, happens to have been applied to this horrible situation. Strauss was able to do that. He once said that um, if you gave me a railway, t railway timetable, I'd set it to the most beautiful music. Um, so is this a fault? Well, again, uh, just to conclude, uh, to get you to compare two portrayals of the crucifixion. Grunewald, uh, the, um, the f f famous Eisenheim altarpiece in Germany, uh, gives a hyper-realistic portrayal under the horror of the of the crucifixion, such that um, nobody can say that he's denying the reality of this, um, or that, uh, that, 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 there is, that he's turning away or falsifying. There's no falsification. But 
somehow it leaves you uh, without hope. There's, it's as though it really is just that, the, the death and destruction of a, uh, of a person. Whereas in Tintoretto's case, much harder to, oh, it's, it's not too bad on the screen. Uh, there you see the most extraordinary sequence of events in which actually uh, the redemption of not just of the, the, not just the resurrection of Christ, but the redemption of mankind is foretold in every, every detail of the painting. And this, therefore, is not a hor horrifying painting at all, but actually a, a consoling one, uh, and one in which you see just why it is that Christ had to be sacrificed. Uh, from Grunewald, you don't know why it is. It's just yet another inexplicable in, uh, and um, horrifying accident of, the, uh, of human degenerate life. So anyway, those are two examples that you might take away to think about. And uh, I think I've gone on for long enough now. I can invite some questions. So thank you. Um, We'd invite you, please, to use the microphone. We have a few minutes for questions. And then uh, Dr. Scruton has agreed to autograph some books. They're available for purchase. If you'd like to, he'll be there for a few minutes and would uh, be happy to sign some for you uh, as soon as the Q&A is over. Right. We'll go about 10 or 15 minutes. You can ask about anything else that I haven't spoken about, as long as it's not Brexit or Trump. <laughs> That's just what I was going to ask you about. I don't mm. think this works. Is it on? Ah, there we go. So my question is this. I have a dilemma as a listener to music or other art forms. When I know that this particular artist is perhaps living a life of dissipation mm. or is immoral in some way, and yet the art they're creating seems to be uh, an art full of light, is that my difficulty that I'm not seeing the dissipation in their art? Is that something that I should be judging if we're listening to that? Mm. Well, uh, you can live an immoral life and, uh, as it were, compensate for it by putting all the virtue that you fail to have into your works of art. Uh, and this is not unusual, actually, um, that, th uh, you know, I guess quite a lot of the romantic artists were like that. Uh, Schubert led a fairly dissolute life, um, but you won't hear any of it in his music. You feel you'll hear tragedy and uh, and, and pain and suffering, but also uh, the purity, the pure love of the human condition. So uh, there isn't any reason to think this is not possible. Um, one of the problems th these days is that we know too much about artists, uh, and um, so and they do tend to be to live in a slightly wild way. Not all of them, but to honest, you know, there um, there are very few of a few great artists whom one can imagine living uh, a respectable middle-class married life with 2.5 children and dressed in a three-piece suit every day. Um, it just does, doesn't seem to work that, that way. But there were some, but they weren't necessarily the best. So divorce the art from the artist? Yeah, I think um, th there's in the li literature on this, there's quite a few people who wa uh, write about things called the intentional fallacy. It's a fallacy to think that works of art have to be understood in terms of the intention of the artist. Um, and the others who write about the death of the author, the author disappears behind his work. All we have is his work. Dostoevsky was a completely degenerate character, but um, his, his, uh, his novels are imbued with the highest kind of Christian o orthodoxy. Okay. Hi, I'm curious more about what you were saying on aesthetics and um, specifically when you talked about relishing yes. versus exploring. And for me, what I interpreted that to mean was relishing in the style or the specific manner of the art and then allowing yourself not to be confined to that. Is that what you meant or is it something more? 
Um, well, I meant that there, is, there are two different attitudes to art. The, the attitude of the connoisseur who, um, who, who wants to experience new things and ever more refined emotions and enjoys those emotions for their own sake and regards himself as somehow uh, a kind of virtuoso of feeling. Um, there's that response, which is sort of the aestheticist response, and then there's the response of somebody who, who sees the work of art as a means of exploring the world, uh, and something that she's taking him on a, uh, on a, an adventure into knowledge and, to, and into the moral reality, which is a, which is a more healthy attitude. That's a, that's all I wanted to say. Okay, and you're saying they need to be merged together. That, that's well, the that both are there, and, and, but the question is, wh which are you going to emphasize? Uh, and uh, 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 the emphasizing of the relishing can uh, can lead to this kind of narcissistic uh, 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 self, self. Yeah, uh, concentration on the self. Yeah. So my, my question is basically that we have a lot of art that's great and, and wonderful art, but has been tarnished not by the artist's reputation himself, but by society. Certain pieces of art, such as the operas of Wagner or some of the uh, mm. uh, like less politically correct works of Gilbert and Sullivan or other, other artists in all different mediums have been tarnished, not because of who these artists were, maybe someone of Wagner, but in case of Wagner, but because a society has deemed these pieces of art immoral based on how they are used or how they are viewed in the light of today's society. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that and how ought we to respond to those kind of arts today? Well, yeah, these, um, of course, what you mean is that works of art can pick up uh, bad associations through their use. Um, uh, and it's not very different from what the first question uh, um, was about, you know, uh, does this affect the intrinsic value of the work of art or is it just an extraneous thing? We all know in the case of Wagner uh, that, that he's, he was tainted with the brush of anti-Semitism, uh, well, it wa and that was his fault. He certainly was anti-Semitic. He, re he wrote the most horrible things about the, uh, about the Jews, but he wrote them before hundred years before Hitler without envisaging anything like that. But the Nazis um, took a, a serious interest in his operas and always presented them as though they were celebrations of the Nazi ideal, ideal of the Aryan race. And this um, ha did lead to many people being totally put off them and thinking that, that they can only be used in that way because there is something in them that lends them to that use. And um, that's one of the great questions for, for Wagner lovers. Can you rescue his works from that accusation? Um, I, this is an important question for me because I just tried to do this with a, I, I wrote a, I've just written a big book on the ring of the Nibelung, uh, which, do, which does rescue, or at least in my view, it does rescue Wagner. For well, all I'm those glad that, that someone's going to rescue Wagner because I love Wagner's well, There you are, you see, well, <laughs> you're on the right line. See, uh, <laughs> all you have to do now is save up and buy this book. <laughs> <laughs> poor college student in Provo can't, probably can't afford right. that book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank okay. you so much. Okay. <clears throat> What's the most beautiful color? <laughs> Objectively. Uh, uh, the most beautiful color, objectively, is the pale violet used by Tiepolo in, uh, in painting the lips of degenerate women. <laughs> What's the most truthful one? Uh, I think that one is equally truthful, yeah. <laughs> oh, other people are coming up. I was going to say more, but... Well, uh, uh, Back to the Kincaid and the Van Gogh. Um, hmm. I'm a, uh, between the two of them, I'll take home the Van Gogh. I think I'm with you on that. Hmm. Uh, and my response to the Kincaid that you presented when I saw it was a kind of revulsion. So uh, I'm kind of perplexed, though, by a pang of sympathy that I imagine myself feeling for someone who might look at the Kincaid, which I would, I'd, I'd say kitschy is hmm. how I'd call that. Yeah. Uh, and I can imagine someone uh, of religious sensibility, maybe not my kind of religious sensibility, 
uh, looking at the Kincaid and feeling a kind of genuine moral um, edification right. yeah. from a picture that I would call kitschy. And I'm, I'm curious about my own reluctance to dismiss it entirely out of hand for that reason. Well, this is a very important observation. Of course, yeah, the, the natural description of it is kitsch. Uh, and um, we don't, it's a very difficult concept to define kitsch or, or to put your finger on exactly what's wrong with it. Um, but e even more, it, it, is it difficult to put your finger on what's wrong with the person who loves kitsch? Um, maybe there's nothing wrong with uh, that person at all. It's just that he or she has no taste in, in art. Um, <coughs> Uh, but uh, it doesn't follow that that the, his religious emotions directed towards the Kincaid are for that reason false. And this is the real question. It, uh, it's um, in um, there's a very beautiful story by James Joyce called The Dead, which is the last story in Dublin. There's another book that the young people are about to read. Um, which, in which he, he describes a, a, a re reunion of people uh, um, whose, whose emotions are all wrapped up with sentimental songs and, and uh, uh, weak little memories uh, of the past. And, but there's a real regret and a real love in there. And so so they're, they are directing all their emotions through kitsch objects and kitsch uh, language. And yet the story itself is completely redeemed from kitsch. It's not... It's about kitsch, but not itself kitsch. Um, and that's, uh, it's a very interesting revelation because it, it's a, a forgiving story which shows that indeed uh, people can uh, uh, latch their emotions onto these unworthy objects and that we aesthetes who see through them, these may be actually not such good people as the people who love those, those things. Yeah, I see, it's the, cor the sort of corollary would be um, uh, a kind of um, malicious judgment I might pronounce on someone that I see in a European museum with their guidebooks, mm. knowledgeably scrutinizing a religious painting that yeah. I suspect means little to them as yes. a religious painting. It yes. However aesthetically informed they may be. Yes, but we do want, in the end, we do want the content of a religious painting, uh, the religious content, to be to somehow match the aesthetic uh, experience, as in the the Tintoretto, isn't just a beautiful painting. It's t it's tr it's a triumph of religious thinking as well. Thank you. Hmm. Let's take these last two. And then okay. Hi, um, I loved what you had to say. Is this on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, so I love what you had to say about repetition and prayer. Um, that truth must be rehearsed if it is to be owned, knowing what to feel, and that prayer puts you back into, um, into the relation you are constantly slipping out of. So I, I have two, my question is twofold. What might you say about the role of imagination in prayer? Um, and then what would you say, because on the one hand, I completely agree with you about the importance and primacy of form. Um, hmm. in, in prayer, but what would you say to people who suspect that form becomes rote and belies sincerity? Form becomes rote? Yes, that somehow, that somehow hmm. form could take away from the sincerity that we're striving for. Yes, uh, uh, it's, it's difficult. This, um, there's a famous Victorian hymn that begins, teach us how to pray aright. Um, uh, and um, because we all lack words with which to pray uh, for the simple reason of the huge distance between us and the object. Um, and, we, and that distance can be just overcome just like that with the right words. Uh, and all religions have those uh, basic wrote learned prayers which which help the people to overcome the distance something like the hail mary you know that uh, every catholic is able to put himself immediately in the presence of god with that prayer or the hero israel of the jews you know um and and so on so uh, uh, 
we need also to make our particular requests and our particular um, establish our particular re uh, uh, relation with with God, and there imagination is important. We, but on the other hand, um, it's a little bit like the Kincaid example again. Uh, you know, we might just end up uh, uh, uttering total platitudes and cliches. You know, God must think to himself, I've heard all that so many times, uh, and I gave you this really good prayer. Can't you say that? <laughs> you know, um, there, there are real questions as to, as to how to go forward with, that, with the imagination. And, um, and how to go forward safely, really. Um, and I think that's one reason why religious poetry is so useful to us. Someone like George Herbert uh, gives us new prayers of his own, which also co correspond to bits of us which haven't been put into the language of prayer before. I think that's all I can say, though. No, that's lovely. Thank you. Um, so I'm hoping to major in communications, and um, I'm fascinated by how you speak of um, the importance of ruminating over art and allowing it to teach us different truths. Mm. Um, I feel like in the world today, um, especially my generation, the, the I generation, as they say, the social media generation, it seems to be more focused on um, rapidity of sharing information less on you know reflection yeah and more about who can get what out first i guess my question is as a man who has spent his entire life um studying aesthetics and and appreciating art what would you say to someone in my shoes who finds themselves in this world that seems to discourage this type of artistic reflection yes. I think you, this is a very important question. Um, I have it when I, my own children have this question, obviously, uh, is there your, or slightly younger than you. And um, there are two things to say. One is that, of course, social media has changed the nature of communication because it's taken away the filters through which people communicated. Uh, um, it, when I was young, to communicate something re really important, like uh, 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 say your love for someone, you would write a letter. Uh, and uh, there'd be lots of crossings out, and then you'd do another version. Uh, you know, the, the written word filters out all the cliches and all the nonsense, and eventually, if you're lucky, you've got uh, something that, that she can keep uh, 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 and treasure, uh, or if you're not lucky, throw away. Um, <laughs> But uh, you know that was that's a kind of filter that 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 uh, forces you to um, to improve what you're saying to the point where you yourself are conscious of what you're saying. Uh, as you know from Twitter, I, d I said I wouldn't t refer to Trump, but this is a, such an obvious example. Um, you can there you can just throw out from your uh, into the world to make contact with millions of people half-formed thoughts in which all your incompetence and, uh, and illiteracy are perpetuated. Um, should, should you do that? Um, you know, uh, maybe that's the way things will be. Uh, uh, but you, if you're studying communications, what you should be addressing is the question whether you can keep the value of these immediate communications of tw Twitter and Facebook and so on, and in gradually improve the form. Can you in introduce a filter? You know, the only filter in, twi in Twitter is the number of characters and so on. Um, but in Facebook, you know, people, you could perhaps start a movement whereby people learn how to despise the badly arranged wall and the, the illiterate words and so on. Uh, you know, introduce criticism into, the, into social media. That might, that might be a step forward. Um, I, I admit it won't get you to the point where T.S. Eliot might have joined Facebook. Right. But uh, uh, the, uh, alternatively, of course, there is the possibility of not using social media at all. Uh, and um, that's, 
there is a real question then uh, of whether, whether you gain from that or lose. Uh, you certainly gain a better quality of, of contacts, but uh, a far less quantity. You know, uh, and um, that, that, for many young people, that's the problem. It's the quantity of contacts and the immediacy of the, of the r relations with them, which is really the, temp the temptation. Um, so I don't really have anything to say because it, uh, uh, that, that would give you a cause for, for, um, for hope. I mean, th this, th this the social media are now with us, uh, and that's the way we're going to be governed, it seems. Uh, as well as the way in which we establish relations with each other. Um, and um, maybe in the end, there'll be small communities of savages who don't use these things, um, <laughs> like, like me, but our circle of acquaintances will get s smaller and smaller uh, until we can all be contained in one museum. Thank you. Okay. And if you ever fall and join Twitter, I'll be sure to follow you. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>